Um, okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our second uh, seminar this semester. And we are honored to host uh, Professor Thomas Stevens from Uppsala University in Sweden. Uh, Thomas is an associate professor at Uppsala at the Department of uh, Earth Sciences since 2014. He was a former bureau member of the uh, International Association of Sedimentology. Uh, his education, he got a Bachelor in Geography, University of Wales in 2001, a Master, uh, a master of Science in Geosciences at the University of Massachusetts in 2003, and a PhD in Quaternary Geochronology at the Jesus College, University <laughs> of Oxford in 2007. He's a lecturer. Uh, uh, he was a lecturer at Kingston University and between 2007 and 2009, and then a senior lecturer at Royal Holloway University of London until 2014. His main interests lie in understanding the Earth's climate and landscape history. His focus is generally on Nelgen to Quaternary Age sediments, especially thus deposits. But he is also interested in Cenozoic, river evolution, sand dunes, as climate uh, archives, and past sea level change. His research, <coughs> sorry, his research also links closely to questions regarding human evolution, migration, and cultural development. I'm sure that you will have a great audience with this interest in, uh, in our department. So today he is going to talk about uh, dust in the wind, Cenozoic plus provenance and atmospheric dust transport over your ratio. And the podium is yours. Thanks very much uh, and for that introduction and um, also for inviting me to give this talk at this uh, fantastic seminar series. It's really a pleasure. Um, so what I, when I sent this uh, title in, Dust in the Wind, Cenozoic Provenance and Atmospheric Dust Transport across Eurasia, I left it deliberately big and open because I wasn't exactly sure what what I would talk about here. Now I've decided a bit and as you, this is far too big a topic to cover in one one seminar. So what I'm going to do, because I think a lot of you are students, masters, PhD students, I will introduce to you a bit about LERS, the background to LERS, what it is, how it's important in relation to dust, atmospheric dust, which is the title of the talk. Um, and then go into a few examples from my research group about how we try and understand the importance of, of dust in the atmosphere in the past from LERS deposits using provenance studies and using geochronology, so detailed um, age dating of, of these deposits. So the idea here is that we're trying to use LERS deposits like this in the picture in the background here, and this is in Tajikistan, um, to uh, help us understand basics of dust generation, transport and deposition in the geologic past. So uh, what am I looking at here? Well, I mean, from the title, you can guess that uh, I'm interested in LERS. And these are LERS deposits. And um, this is a picture from uh, the Chinese LERS plateau uh, in the north central China. You can see some people down here for scale. And uh, these uh, really thick sequences of sediment like this, this is basically the geologic record of this. So over tens of thousands to millions of years, you have these dust storms transporting uh, clays, silts, fine sands in the atmosphere over kilometers, tens of kilometers or longer, hundreds of kilometers, and end up, end up over thousands to millions of years, building up into sequences that look like this, in some cases anyway. These really thick, homogeneous sediment sequences that can be hundreds of meters in thickness like these deposits in China. Um, so, LERS is effectively this transport of, of dust in dust storms, and, and dust uh, is transported in the atmosphere basically in two ways, in suspension transport, both ways, but there is low level suspension, lower in the atmosphere, just a, a, up to a few kilometers high up, but mostly within a kilometer of the surface, um, which then is uh, transported over kilometers, tens of kilometers downwind and becomes finer and finer as it goes downwind. So low level atmospheric transport, basically. And then you have also 
strong upward motion of the air and you have high level uh, dust uh, entering the uh, coming high into the atmosphere up until 10 kilometers high up until the tropopause basically so the top of the troposphere where it is blown around the hemisphere uh, by uh, the jet streams so the jet streams distribute this over a very wide area so this dust is transported over thousands and thousands of kilometers before it's descending either descending air or it's rained out so wet or dry deposition. Uh, so that's how dust is transported in the atmosphere through these suspension processes. And if you look at the uh, diagram here below, you can see a grain size distribution of LUS. So what, uh, how, what the size of the particles are that forms LUS. And you have a uh, component here, which is dominant, which is the coarse grain component, this, this big peak here a peak in a, a mode somewhere between 10 to 60 microns in diameter. So uh, where the dominant size of this dust is around 50, 60, 70 microns in diameter. So, so coarse silt. And that's the majority of, of LERS is made up of this relatively medium to coarse silt component, this peak here. But there's also a finer tail to finer grain sizes, to clay sizes, to fine silt sizes, one, two, three, five or six microns in diameter. So a kind of a tail off of these uh, uh, um, finer grains, which may actually be uh, more of a separate peak. It may be a separate, um, uh, separate modal peak. So we have a bimodal distribution maybe of these finer particles. And some people interpret that to mean that basically LERS is the uh, record of these two components of dust transport, this near source, low level, relatively close to the source transport of uh, dust low in the atmosphere, dom represented by this coarse grain component, but also containing some of these grains transported over much longer distances higher up in the atmosphere, as reflected in that, that fine grain mode as well. So perhaps LERS then reflects these two modes of suspension of, of atmospheric dust. Anyway, um, the result is, uh, is this, basically. These are photos from Tajikistan, from LERS in Central Asia in Tajikistan. And uh, you can see uh, these really uh, thick, homogenous, uh, freestanding uh, sediments, which uh, are deposited as quaternary age LERS deposits in Tajikistan. I want you to focus on, on this picture here on the right-hand side. You can see that we've cut down into uh, the sediment sequence on a cliff. Uh, so we have a trench dug into the cliff here, and you can see someone for scale here. What I'm going to show in the next uh, slide is a video of uh, the other side, so from a drone. So a drone has taken a video of the cliff from the other side. So keep in mind this trench and you'll get some perspective on the next slide. And here you go. Uh, so uh, this, uh, here's the trench that we just had a look at. And then you can see some more trenches here. Um, and uh, another one here, and then steps uh, connecting them up. And let's play the video. Um, and you can see, you begin to get a sense of the scale of these incredible deposits. This is in Tajikistan, remember. Here's some people for scale down here sampling on the slope. So this cliff covers um, hundreds of meters of LERS accumulation over the last one to one and a half million years. So this is one and a half million years of, of dust storms being forming these extraordinarily thick, large sequences. So this LERS is homogeneous. There's not much stratigraphy. There's no layering, no banding so much. It's massive, buff colored, so yellow. So very, very, very homogeneous. And it blankets pre-existing terrain. So any pre-existing topography is blanketed by these LERS, these dust deposits. So keep in mind that these incredible sequences, they're just dust storm sediments built up over, over hundreds of thousands of years. Um, I would say just uh, that they're not entirely homogenous. Um, I don't wanna create that impression completely because if you look at this photo from China, you can see these bands, faint darker bands in the LERS. These are, um, ancient soils, fossil soils or paleosols, formed um, during warm, wet climate periods when uh, you had soils forming on the less, and then you have more dust being deposited on the top during colder, drier phases. 
So you get then the alternation of these soils and lurse and soils and lurse deposits, which, um, which uh, build up lurse stratigraphy. And we can just think about a conceptual model of this lurse stratigraphy. Very basically, here it is on the right hand side, that you have this lurse being deposited mostly under glacial conditions, so cold climate conditions in the quaternary. When it's cold and dry, when you have high dust accumulation rates and low rates of soil development. And then in interglacials, in warmer phases, when it's warmer and wetter, we have low dust accumulation rates and higher rates of soil development. So then we get these soils developing on the less. And during interstadials, maybe just a weak soil is developed. So in this way, you get over the long term, uh, over hundreds of thousands of years, you get this, this development of this soil uh, stratigraphy, um, which represents glacial interglacial cycles. Um, so these have been one of the best terrestrial forms of evidence for glacial interglacial cycles within the quaternary. Um, it's also though important to note that the LERS isn't just a quaternary phenomena because we always think of it as a quaternary deposit that we tend to because that's when we have most LERS uh, on the planet but in different places. Um, but we in China, for example, um, we have a record that goes back even to the Eocene. So even 40 million years or so, um, we have LERS deposits relatively continuously forming up until the present day. Here, for example, on the left, you have quaternary LERS overlying this Pliocene, Miocene red clay deposits. Now, red clays are simply finer grained version, uh, a more weathered, finer grained, redder version of, uh, of these LERS deposits. Um, so it also it's windblown dust. Um, so we have these long records in the Cenozoic, but on the right hand side, this is a photo, this is where I was on field work just this weekend, in fact, in southern, southern England on the coast, and these are deposits of a Triassic mudstone, which is also interpreted to be, by some at least, to be an ancient lurse, so a Triassic lursite formed in, in uh, deserts in central Pangaea, about 240 million years or so ago. So we also have lurse in the geologic record pre-Cenozoic too. It's just harder to recognize sometimes. Okay, so general background to LERS, why are we interested in it? What's the point of us uh, working on it? Um, well, perhaps most importantly, uh, or most obviously, these LERS records represent really important climate archives. And it's argued that because of the length of the record and how, sometimes how detailed they are, they form the most, the, lo the longest and most detailed climate records we have on land, full stop, available to us. So we can look at this diagram on the top here. This red line is magnetic susceptibility from a site in uh, northern China on the Chinese Lurs Plateau called Shifung. And uh, it's, uh, um, it shows soil forming, changes in soil formation in the Lurs with soils higher up and, and Lurs lower down here. And you can see these alternations on glacial interglacial timescales. The blue line here is the uh, ice volume as represented from the um, marine benthic oxygen ice type record. So you can see the close correspondence between soil formation on the Chinese Lurs Plateau and uh, glacial interglacial cycles and ice volume. So it's argued that these are some of our most important records of, uh, of, of ice age climate, basically, of quaternary ice age climate, long and detailed climate records. And this is also true that they are, it's, they are a terrestrial deposit. This is a sediment formed on land and therefore gives us a rare chance to look in detail and in over the long time scale at climate where people live, climate on terrestrial ecosystems. Again, in China, here's the Chinese Lurs Plateau. This is an area where the East Asian monsoon brings rainfall in the summer and dry cold winds from central interior of Asia in the, in the, in the winter. This is a system that affects over 1 billion people. And so trying to understand the history of the monsoon is a critical question. And, and that's where LERS is very important, again, to try and understand these terrestrial, these systems which affect terrestrial ecosystems, populations, and so on. Um, an important aspect of LERS as well is that we can then trace these climate records and compare them over a very large area because LERS deposits cover, as you can see on this map, shaded areas of LERS. Um, they cover more than 10% of the world's, uh, world's continents. 
So we have a large area where we can take a climate record and directly compare it to another one with the same kind of sets of assumptions. Um, so they're, they're incredibly widespread and then very useful for tracing climate over a wide area. In addition, and not only are these deposits excellent climate archives, um, they also in places contain uh, human artifacts or even human fossils. So for example, these deposits in, in Tajikistan that we're sampling here, um, you can see trenches being dug and, and large sections being cut here. These have uh, many layers where terrestrial, where artifacts, paleolithic artifacts are, are buried within, um, within certain layers, stretching back even close to a million years. So we have multiple bands of artifact layers within this LUS, which uh, are um, effectively showing a, a record of human migration in an occupation in that area and different types of humans from Homo erectus to Homo sapiens with multiple different technologies. So we can look at the evolution of those technologies, the evolution of humans through looking at these LUS, these layers, these, cult, these, ar these artifact layers within the LUS. So that's one of my recent projects actually is uh, on uh, this human occupation uh, and the timing and ecology and human occupation of, of Central Asia, this Thoka uh, project here, focusing on Tajikistan. So there's a climate record, but also a record that we can understand the context of human evolution. And then I suppose what's the main topic of this talk really, which is the, the other third important issue is dust. Um, because as I've mentioned, LERS is basically windblown mineral dust accumulated and modified when it's deposited, but accumulated uh, over geologic time. So it can really help us understand the history of, of dustiness in the atmosphere, the history of mineral dust. Um, and uh, dust today, as shown by this picture from uh, not uh, just almost a year ago, basically, uh, from Beijing in China, one of the uh, one of the uh, worst dust storms they experienced in in decades, uh, shrouded northern China, and you can see this incredible uh, haze of dust in the, in the atmosphere. I guess also you have this in Israel as well, um, and uh, you uh, can see here a satellite image of this dust storm. Here's Mongolia, here's a uh, Korean Peninsula, and then China here. And here is a um, large sweep of a, of a frontal system, a depression, you can see here, and then a plume of dust following after it, covering almost the entire length of, of China over a very wide area. A vast amount of dust being blown around in the atmosphere from the arid regions of Asia. This is a huge hazard today. So it's a hazard for your health, breathing it in it's a uh, over long-term exposure it can cause asthma and silicosis and health hazards like that uh, it's a transport issue planes can be grounded by this um, and it's it's dangerous it's uh, affects pollution levels and so on so dust is a really important topic from the perspective of human health but perhaps from our perspective as uh, looking in the geologic past uh, the human aspect we we may be more focused more on the impact on climate because dust has a major, is a major component of the climate system, mineral dust. So dust, uh, is, uh, dust has a major impact on incoming solar radiation. Depending on the grain size, it absorbs and scatters incoming solar radiation, which has a direct forcing response, a direct heating response on, on Earth's surface. So depending on the amount of dust in the atmosphere and the type of dust, it can cool or warm climate. Um, by radiative forcing. A second effect is that dust in the atmosphere can is a, acts as cloud condensation nuclei. So cloud droplets of water condense onto the surface of the dust and form clouds. So without this dust, you end up with, with less clouds. So more, more dust potentially gives more clouds and different types of clouds. And these clouds have a major effect on climate because of their changing albedo. They also change precipitation patterns and so on. A third effect is that dust contains many nutrients, for example, iron, which are depleted in certain areas, in terrestrial ecosystems, but especially in, in some marine ecosystems. So dust blown in from a source area onto the ocean in a depleted area 
can effectively act as a fertilizer, which, which drives blooms in, uh, in productivity. And that productivity increases due to dust sedimentation or dust deposition, um, changes carbon cycle in the atmosphere because productivity um, will remove carbon from the atmosphere through photosynthesis. So more dust in the atmosphere increases in productivity and carbon drawdown. So it has an effect on greenhouse gas composition of the atmosphere too. So aerosol effect, direct forcing effect, cloud effect, and uh, productivity and, uh, and greenhouse gas composition. There's also a direct albedo effect as well. If, if dust lands on a surface like an ice surface, that can act to uh, change the albedo of that surface and change absorption of radiation and, and change melting of ice, for example. So there's many ways that uh, dust can affect the climate system, but it's not a, it's not a one-way process. It's much more of a cycle. So I don't want you to worry about the detail of this uh, image. It's too complicated, really, for the, for a presentation. But um, what I want you to know is that dust emission changes climate. Okay, so it affects radiative forcing and so on. But dust emission itself, of course, is affected by by climate itself. So there's a cycle. Climate change impacts dustiness, and dustiness drives climate change. Um, in multiple complex feedbacks. There are complex, multiple complex feedback loops between dust and climate. And this is really a chicken and egg question to some extent. Which came first, the dust, or the, the dust change or the climate change? What's driving what? If we look at a particular event, climate event with involving dust, is it dust responding to climate change or is dust driving the climate change? There's no easy answer to any of this. Um, and because of all these complex feedbacks, this is one of the most poorly constrained, in a way, aspects of the climate system. So dust in the atmosphere and its response to climate and, dry, dry, and how it drives climate change is very poorly understood in many ways. So it's critical we get an understanding of it. We get a handle on how climate can be affected by dust and vice versa. Going back to LERS then, what's really important that LERS is, a, LERS is an important record of this dust. So LERS gives us an opportunity to understand this in the past. It dominantly contains this coarse dust. Uh, so here I've, I've defined that as greater than five microns, um, which this coarse dust, but also I suppose has, contains the fine dust too. So we have a record of both the coarse and the fine. So less than and greater than five microns. And now it's important to note that these have different forcing effects. So coarse dust here um, has a, a much shorter residence time, of course, because it's transported from much shorter distances and lower levels in the atmosphere. But because um, uh, coarse dust uh, absorbs more radiation, incoming solar radiation, it actually has a net warming effect on the atmosphere. And coarse dust is also more abundant and it's a more effective cloud condensation nuclei, it acts more effectively as cloud condensation nuclei. So it has very specific forcing effects. Fine dust, by contrast, scatters uh, incoming solar radiation dominantly, so actually has a cooling effect. So the type of dust in the past is important, um, how it might affect climate. And it's obviously more complex than this because mineralogy and chemistry and shape also change all of the forcing effects as well. Um, so LERS can allow us to look at past activity in the coarse dust fraction, which is especially poorly understood in its forcing effects, but also this fine dust too. So it's very useful in window into understanding these aspects of dustiness. So, okay, how specifically can LERS help? Let's start answering these questions and getting into some specific examples. Well, let's rephrase this question and ask, what do we need to know actually uh, to reconstruct the possible effects of dust on climate and vice versa? What is it we need to understand about dust in the past? One thing we need to understand is the amount of dust in the atmosphere. So if we, we can't know the forcing effect of dust on climate, unless we know how much there was, in the atmosphere at a given time. So how much dust, amount of dust in the atmosphere? Um, and uh, we also know, need to know about its properties. 
its mineralogical and chemical properties and its size, because these have direct impacts on its forcing effect, as I've just stated. We also need to understand where dust is coming from, what the emitters are, where the dust emitting regions are, because these, these places are responding to environmental changes. Um, and uh, they're responding to, to climate environment uh, and how they influence dust emissions. So if we're gonna understand that cycle of climate change and dust change, one of the key ways to do that is to understand what's driving changes in dust emission. And that involves understanding dust sources. So the key thing with LERS is that it can help us address these. It can get to the heart of these questions. We can start to use LERS to look at how much dust there was in the atmosphere in the past, its properties and its size, and where that mm -hmm. dust came from. And what I'm going to do for the rest of this talk is actually um, explain a, couple, a few examples from my research work and my group's research work of how we can actually do that using specific examples, how we can constrain the amount of dust from LERS and how, much, how we can constrain the provenance of it as well. Okay, so <clears throat> I want to start by showing this, this slide, which is a study I was involved in, published a fair while ago now in uh, 2014, I think, uh, 15, 2015, in Climate of the Past. A big study, which was like a, a compilation um, of records of dust deposition in the Holocene. Okay, so what are good records of dust deposition in the Holocene. These are what these dots are, all right? Um, and uh, this was uh, then used to help constrain and test modeling of dust, um, atmospheric dust uh, deposition. So then use, using these uh, terrestrial, these archives, sorry, not terrestrial, this is marine as well and ice core and so on. Um, these records of dustiness and using them to try and test and constrain models of dust deposition. And from that estimate or model simulate dust loading in the atmosphere. That's the amount of dust in the atmosphere in the past. So this is like the first step towards taking archives of dust and saying, what, what can we then understand about what's going on in terms of the atmosphere in the past? How much dust was there in the atmosphere? So these are the records that we used. And what I want you to note, is, and this is the simulation from it, all right? And what I want you to note is, is firstly, if you look on land, there's very, very few records of, uh, of this dust. There are very few suitable records that were used in this compilation, even for the Holocene. Why is that the case? When we have LERS covering 10% of the world, why is it that we have these huge gaps in uh, suitable records for helping us simulate dust in the atmosphere? And in my view, the simple answer for that is chronology, all right? Very, very few of these LERS sites have really good independent high, resolu high resolution age models. So we need really good independent age models in order to calculate dust accumulation rates, to know how much dust is being deposited. And unfortunately, there are not that many LERS sites yet that have really detailed chronologies. So we, what I'm saying is we require detailed high resolution independent numerical based age models to develop these good enough uh, dust accumulation rates for allowing us to use then in these compilations that I showed before. Here I'll give an example of a record that is good enough, which uh, again, I was involved in publishing in 2017 uh, in PNAS. And uh, it's a, a LERS site, you can see the picture here on the Danube uh, in Hungary, this DSZ site. I won't even try and pronounce it because I always get it wrong. Hungarian is not an easy language to pronounce, I find. Um, uh, but this is the site DSZ in Hungary. I'm sorry, I can help you with that. I'm from Hungary. <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk later about that then. Thank you so much. Because <laughs> but it's fine. no matter how much my colleagues help me with this, I still fail to get it right. I don't know. I, I can't get my mouth around it. <laughs> so I call it DSZ. <laughs> Thanks for your offer. Okay. Please go on. Sorry. <laughs> uh, no problem. Um, so what we did, we sampled this sequence in extremely high sampling interval every few centimeters uh, to look for radiocarbon datable material. So if small gastropods in the LERS uh, and also charcoals are in the LERS. 
And then we radiocarbon dated them. And these blue, blue marks are the radiocarbon ages. And this is uh, worth pointing out that this is still by far and away the most detailed dated less sequence there is to date. So it's an extremely high density of ages here. From those ages, from those radiocarbon ages, then we can uh, construct a age depth function using Bayesian modeling, using uh, the R Bacon software, a Bayesian statistical model, which allows us to develop a detailed age depth model. So this age model here, which is this black shaded line with uncertainty bounds on it. And that, that can be quite precise then because of the number of ages. And it's that age depth model that allows us then to derive our dust accumulation rates, which is what this diagram is here on the left-hand side. So the, what comes from basically the derivative of this model is uh, your dust accumulation, how much dust per unit time there is. And so the peaks and troughs, they, they represent phases, peaks of high dust accumulation and, and the valleys here, the troughs are low dust accumulation phases. Um, here is the record, the same record here in red. Okay, now on an age axis, 32,000 uh, years ago uh, to 24, and uh, plotted alongside the Greenland dust record in blue here. All right, this is calcium, abundance of calcium ions in Greenland ice, and this is a proxy for very fine dust that gets to Greenland. You can ignore this green line, actually. The, this is a speleothem from, from the Alps, which tells us uh, about moisture, origin of moisture. But the main story for us is this, these two, the red and the blue here. Uh, oops. And uh, up here, we have the age, uh, the two sigma uncertainty on the age models. And you can see that the age model we get from this, uh, this sequence has lower uncertainty than the age model on the Greenland. Uh, ice core. So we can look really at fine detail on these events. And you can see extraordinary variability in dust accumulation. All right, this is one of the first times where we can see at this level of detail, decades, centuries, and thousands of years, millennia, extremely high variability in a dust accumulation rate. Before that, we had no idea really from, from these dust records. Um, and what it also allows us to do is link these changes to changes in other areas like on Greenland. So we can see that the peaks in dust accumulation on Greenland tend to match some most of the time, at least those that we see in Hungary. And also the reductions in, in, in dust accumulation rate also generally match those in, in, in Hungary and with Greenland. And they also match climate changes too. So these dust uh, these pe periods where you have less dust, these are Greenland interstadials. These are warm phases in the last glacial on Greenland. So warm phases on Greenland equals less dust on Greenland, but also less dust in Hungary as well. So this is really the first key evidence that allows us to link completely independently with completely different independent age models, dust accumulation and climate over in from Central Europe all the way to, to uh, the Arctic, Arctic Northern Atlantic. It's the first independent evidence of these connections in the dust cycle. Uh, another example um, I'm, I would just like to give um, is using, we don't need just use radiocarbon dating. We can also use other techniques like luminescence dating. So optically stimulated luminescence dating is a very useful technique for dating less. Um, and here we dated a site uh, called Pegwell Bay here, which I can pronounce <laughs> in uh, southeast, uh, southeastern England. We dated this at 20 centimeter intervals, published uh, a couple of years ago. Um, and uh, here you have about three to four meters of LERS um, deposited at that, that site. And what's remarkable about it, the luminescence dating showed that pretty much all of it is deposited over just a few thousand years. So instead of it covering tens of thousands of years, this is actually deposited in just a few thousand years in an incredibly dusty period where it was extraordinarily dusty. Not only that, we see from the age model that comes from the uh, luminescence dating that, that the dust accumulation occurs in two main peaks, two main periods. One from around 23 to 25,000 years here, then a slower period, and then again another peak later on, where we have higher accumulation rates around 20 to 19, 
thousand years ago. So two, two peaks. And what we argued in that paper was that actually we, we think that these, this short time scale of dust deposition is related to, uh, and the two peaks in dust accumulation is related to the fact that this coincides with advances and retreats of this lobe of ice. So this is the last ice sheet limits during the last glacial maximum um, in the North Sea. And of course, this is all dried up during the last glacial maximum because it's uh, relatively shallow and uh, the sea level is 120 meters lower. Uh, so you, uh, you have, uh, uh, basically this is dry land where you have rivers coming down here, draining the ice sheets. And the advance and retreat of this lobe of ice occurred a few times and seems to correspond when, when it retreats with these phases of dust accumulation based on the chronology from the ice sheet retreats. So that means that this Lurst deposition is very dynamic and really closely tied to processes occurring with the ice sheet. So the dynamics and the drainage of ice sheets. So landscape processes are exerting sort of the dominant control on, on dust, dust in the atmosphere over this time period in this region. So there's just a couple of examples from the dating of, of, the, of these last deposits. This is independent dating, okay, using radi radiocarbon and luminescence methods. And these, these results suggest to us a few things that we didn't really know before, not to the extent now that we see from these, these studies. Firstly, that um, dust deposition is really episodic. So it happens in, in big pulses, in big waves. So it's not this continuous background accumulation slowly over long, long time scales. What happens is much more from what we see so far, big phases of accumulation happening in many places at least, which means in terms of atmosphere, highly variable loads in the atmosphere, highly variable amounts of dust in the atmosphere. So one time you have huge abundances and then you have periods where it's much quieter and there's almost nothing. Of course, that has big forcing effects, implications. And then you have phases with very, very rapid deposition. So that means very high lo dust loads in the atmosphere for short periods of time. And then, okay, we need to start thinking about how we model the consequences of that climate model. Um, it seems initially that, we, that this dustiness is coupled over quite a wide area. So it seems that this, like we saw in the Greenland Hungary example, that we can couple dust processes over quite a large area. So maybe even hemispheric but it's too early to be sure really. Uh, and these pulses are, are linked to abrupt climate changes. So the changes in dustiness coincide with changes in abrupt shifts in climate change, Danskar Erschke events, Greenland stadials and interstadials, and also changes in surface processes like ice sheet collapse, drainage and so on. And it's coupled to these climate changes, but what we're not so sure about are the leads and lags involved. What's the causal mechanism? Because that really requires us to have much better edge models than we even have right now. So what changes, so from, okay, we see this variability in the dust in the atmosphere as recorded in LERS. So what's causing these changes in dustiness? That's the next question for us to answer. What is the reason that these abrupt changes occur? We've started to sort of think about that a little bit, but now I'm gonna go into more detail on that. Um, and here, what we really want to, uh, to think about is source, where the material is, is produced, because Lurst deposition requires a number of different things. It requires production of sediment, it requires production of Lurst in a region or, or dust. It requires it to be available, that it's not buried or underneath a deep vegetation cover. It requires a transport agent, so something that moves it into a, into a place where it can be blown in by the wind, or it requires the wind to transport it to the site where it's deposited. And it also requires, of course, the right depositional conditions. Some places you can't, you can't if it's too dry, then perhaps the lurse can't be deposited because it just keeps blowing away again. It just keeps being eroded. Many then of those, those aspects of what controls lurse deposition relate to source, at least the first part. So sediment production availability and some of the initial transport. Okay, this is a question about source. So source, source of dust, source of lurse is critical 
And it's really inherently a question of what's going on in dust emitting areas. And as you can see, there are many possible uh, sources or production mechanisms for giving you all this dust, glacial, glacial grinding, so underneath ice sheets, grinding up a bedrock and so on. Um, <clears throat> aeolian abrasion, uh, so abrading of, uh, uh, of rocks in deserts or uh, blasting of sand grains against each other. Uh, frost shattering uh, down here. Colluvial activity, fluvial comminution, so river systems breaking particles, and also salt weathering, again, an arid process, salt weathering breaking apart particles like that. So loads of ways that we can produce dust. And then you need some of these transport agents like this Piedmont fans or river systems, glaciers, dune movement, and so on, to actually then move that sediment around, get it transported away. So what's going on in the source regions is critical to understand why we have these big changes in dust sediment accumulation and also dustiness in the atmosphere. Just to hammer it home, um, each possible source um, implies different controls. A source from a desert or a dried up lake is a completely different control to a source from an ice sheet or a glacier, because then the environmental controls on dust production are completely different. So source we have to understand, okay? What I'm gonna do now um, is think about how we constrain the source of dust in the past from the last sequences. And I'm gonna give two examples. I guess I only have time for two because already I'm going on too long. Um, and I'll use an example from the Chinese Lurse Plateau, first of all, uh, because it's a, such an important place. Uh, and uh, secondly, I will go back to that site in, uh, in southern England and talk about that and how we understand the source of that sediment and what that means. And we can link that to also the chronology that we have. Okay, so the Chinese Lurse Plateau. Um, this is a, a supremely important place when it comes to Lurse because it's one of the most famous and well-studied regions. Um, it's a, a huge area, 500,000 square kilometers. That's, that's more than 20 times the size of Israel, covered in hundreds of meters, up to 400 meters of Lurse, which goes back 40, maybe even 50 million years, but it's dominantly quaternary. Okay. What a, this is an incredible place. Imagine 20 times of Israel covered in hundreds of meters of dust. That's, that's really something. Um, so, Many people believe that uh, this, here's where the location of the Chinese Lurse Plateau. As I mentioned, it's in the monsoon region. Many people argue that the dust sources are related to these deserts, these arid lands to the north and north uh, west of the Chinese Lurse Plateau over here. And then you have these winter monsoon winds blowing dust to, to the Lurse Plateau. Um, and uh, the Yellow River also runs right over and past and drains uh, on the eastern side of the Lurse Plateau, and it's argued that this is uh, eroding away the Lurse Plateau. Okay, well, that's why it's called the Yellow River, because it's full of Lurse, full of dust eroded from the Lurse Plateau, which then drains into the Yellow Sea, and so you can see why it's called the Yellow Sea. Um, <clears throat> so, okay, how do we test the provenance of Chinese Lurse? Um, most studies tended to use uh, what we would uh, just call whole rock chemistry or bulk sediment chemistry. Um, and this is where we take a sample of sediments and we measure the whole rock or the whole sediment, uh, sediment uh, elemental or, or isotopic composition, strontium isotopes or nidimium isotopes, for example, most commonly used. And uh, we measure the LERS, the composition of the LERS here, and also the composition of various source regions, sediment source possible sediment sources, how they look in terms of these isotopes, their ratios. And then quite simply, the idea is to try and map on where the LERS is in terms of its uh, composition in relation to the source region. So arguing here that the LERS plateau LERS is, is a basically strong similarities to these regions. So it's probably being sourced from, from these areas, like for example, Tibetan plateau, and certain desert. Um, and there are, unfortunately, there are a couple of issues with this. Uh, one is that uh, multiple studies have done this, but they all, many of them tend to come up with different conclusions. Uh, and that's partly because there's a lot of overlap in the chemical composition, the isotopic composition of these different source areas. So they have similar compositions, many of these different source areas, which complicates separating them out. 
And the second issue is, is that um, if you're taking a bulk sediment and your LERS is coming from more than one area, what you do and with two different isotopic compositions, two different com uh, strontium and neodymium compositions, when you measure the bulk material that results from that, the LERS, you measure the, your, what the value you get is the average of that. It's not going to represent the, the actual source compositions of the two source areas. It's going to give you an average of the two, whatever percentages uh, are the mixture of the two. And that's actually quite hard to unpick and un understand. You can try and model these different source contributors, but it's not so, not so straightforward to do. So there's an ambiguity in that. There's an uncertainty in that. One way to get around that is to use single grain approaches. So looking at uh, a property of a single grain, the idea is that an individual grain of LERS, an individual dust grain, can only have come from one place. Okay, that's its source originally. Um, and one of the most popular ways to do this is, is using the mineral zircon. The heavy mineral zircon is a, um, a uh, uh, extremely heavy mineral, robust, resistant to weathering. So it's very, very uh, ubiquitous in, in sediment. Um, and uh, the good thing about uh, zircons as well is that they tend to reject most lead on their formation, but they can, in defects in the crystal structure, they, they contain uranium. And uh, over time, since the mineral grain forms in deep in the crust, kilometers down in the crust, as it forms from a magmatic melt, uh, as the crystallization occurs, after that, then gradually through time, the uranium starts to decay through to, through to lead. So you have effectively a radiometric clock. It's dating. So it's by looking at uranium and lead isotopic composition of the zircons, you can date their formation. So you get a formation age of those zircons when they, when they crystallized, basically. And uh, in different regions, in China, almost anywhere, you have different terrains made up of uh, granitic rocks uh, formed in different time periods, which means that these terrains yield, when they erode, they yield zircons of specific age, different age maybe to another place. And so what we can do is measure a lot of these zircon ages, formation ages in our LERS. So we isolate the zircons, we take a LERS sample, extract the zircons and measure multiple, multiple grains and get an age for each grain, formation age, and then plot a density plot like this, which shows where we've got lots of zircons of certain ages. Like here, we've got a big peak of zircon ages of 450 million years. So many zircons in the LERS formed at 450 million years. And then we can use that information to try and trace back and ask the question, OK, well, where do we have lots of granitic source rocks which yield zircons of that age? So then it can help us trace back to these primary source regions. Um, and because we've got multiple peaks, we can try and apply this to multiple places. So, so this 450 million year peak can come from Tibet and it can come also from this Gobi Altai up here. But these older peaks here, like this 1.9 billion year peak, this comes from the North China Craton originally. So it's formed from crust originating in the North China Craton. So we can see this mixture of sources by unpicking the different peaks in the distribution, in our zircon distribution, age distribution, <clears throat> in our LERS sample. Um, <clears throat> but of course, uh, LERS seldom comes directly from the basement rocks, seldom comes directly from primary source rocks like granites. What it tends to come from much more is sedimentary rocks or sediments. So it's important that to, do, to apply this technique, you have to not just understand the basement rock ages, the terrains ages, but you also need to uh, get an idea of the, the ages of zircons within sediments that could form the source of LERS. So you need to constrain the ages of zircons within the deserts and also, for example, in the Yellow River sediments and so on. So what we did a few years ago now is go on a huge road trip all the way through China, actually more than one road trip, and we sampled uh, or Yellow River sediments from the source up here on the Tibetan Plateau all the way down to uh, its uh, mouth um, in the Yellow Sea, multiple points along the river, and then also took samples of desert sediment in, in, uh, in, in different, uh, different places, possible source regions. And we looked at the zircon ages in these sediments and we compared them to the LERS. And what I'm gonna show you next is the results 
So don't panic. You don't need to read this whole diagram. It's, we will simplify it. This is all of the data. It's a lot of data published here in this paper some time ago now, it's 2015. And we can group that data, okay, into separate groups because what we can say is we can group it by desert and we can also group it by the part of the river that we got it from. So we can group that, that uranium lead data by, by samples that we took from the upper part of the Yellow River, uh, as well as the middle part here. So the upper part drains the Tibetan Plateau and then comes onto this alluvial platform here. The middle part cuts into the Lurs Plateau down here on the eastern side of the Lurs Plateau and then through this, uh, this gorge, Sanman Gorge. Uh, and then the lower part is just the, the lower floodplains uh, on, on the Chinese eastern lowland. Um, so we can group all the data, all this data into those three parts for the Yellow River and, and the deserts. And this is the result, okay. So here's the lower Yellow River, the middle Yellow River and the upper Yellow River and the Zircon distribution. Here is a desert called the Eastern Maosu and also the underlying bedrock, Cretaceous sandstone bedrock that underlies the Lurs Plateau and around areas around it. And then the Lurs itself up here, with the distribution of ages of the Lurs. Um, and uh, I think what you can see <clears throat> here is that there's differences in the Yellow River's zircon age distribution. So we have on the Yellow River in the middle reaches, remember this is the bit that cuts down through the Lurs Plateau before it reaches the lowland. Here you have a single dominant peak in the uh, Paleozoic, in the late Paleozoic, early Mesozoic, and two uh, extremely dominant Proterozoic um, peaks. In contrast, in the upper reaches of the Yellow River in green, we have really two strong peaks in the Paleozoic and early Mesozoic and much less, much fewer of these uh, uh, proterozoic uh, grains. And if you see the Lurs looks very much like the upper Yellow River sample, whereas the middle reaches of the Yellow River look very much like the underlying bedrock. So what we think is actually happening here, if we go back to the image of the map, is that the Yellow River is eroding the Tibetan Plateau material and bringing it down and depositing it onto the floodplains of, the, of the, this part of the upper platform of the Yellow River, where it's being blown by the winds onto the Lurs Plateau. So it's, that's why the, the river has the same signature, the upper part as the Lurs. But where we think, what's interesting is that the, where the river cuts into the Lurs Plateau, then it has a bedrock signature. It doesn't look like the Lurs at all. So what we see is that actually, although the Lurs is being eroded by the Yellow River, actually the dominant sediment load in that river is coming from the underlying bedrock at that point. So it implies that the Yellow River is the source of the Chinese Lurs, or at least a, a significant source of the Chinese Lurs, which was a really radical idea at the time. Um, and uh, most, most people didn't believe this, um, but it's becoming much more accepted now that the, the Yellow River transports material to this alluvial platform where winds then blow the Lurs, because you always need the winds to make the Lurs, you blow this dust onto the Lurs Plateau. It's just the last step. Um, and it means that actually, in this case, river dynamics becomes more important as a, as a control on dust to the Chinese Lurs Plateau, rather than aridity in deserts. So this is more controversial and, and still being debated, but this is the information that comes from, from the zircons here. Now, before I finish, I'll give one more example related back to this Pegwell Bay site, okay, southeastern England. So we're going to shift all the way across to the other side of, of Eurasia now um, and go back to the question of what drives these changes in dust activity. Because uh, this was a question we asked when we noted all these big changes in how much dust there was in the atmosphere and less accumulation. What is it that's driving that in relation to source regions? And we had this idea that, that the LERS here was related to activity of the ice sheet. So we're gonna try and link the two uh, aspects. So what we did was we took uh, samples of the LERS from the two peaks of dust accumulation. So uh, the first peak and the second peak, and we looked at the provenance of those peaks. And we also took sediments from tills in Denmark, from Fenerskandia, 
and also tills in northeastern England from the British Irish ice sheet here, sediment from the North Sea, Glacial Lake, um, and also sediment underlying or Paleocene rock underlying the Lurse at Pegwell Bay, and river, modern river sediments from the Rhine, because actually there's two theories about where the Lurse here comes from. The first theory that's been more accepted up until recently, I suppose, is that the material forming all of this Lurse in yellow here, much of it's coming from the Rhine River or rivers draining Central Europe. So sediment being produced in the Alps, the uplands of, of Central Western Europe, and then transported into the, the dry North Sea, where it's then by rivers, where it's then eroded by the wind and deposited as Lurse. Now, the other idea, as I mentioned before, is that actually the ice sheets are going to be more important because producing sediments by the ice, you then have um, drainage of those ice sheets, which brings meltwater, which is sediment rich. And that also comes down close to the site, close to down this river that drains into the sea here, that drains the channel. This is the Channel River and gives a ready source of dust as well. So we've got two competing hypotheses, okay, two possible sources that we can compare. So the idea here is that we're gonna test those two models and also check whether there's any change in dust, in dust uh, source with these pulses of dust. Um, again, this is quite a complicated diagram to look at, but it's an easy message because we're going to apply again, uranium lead dating zircons. And the critical thing to note is that we can, if we look at the basement ages, so bedrock ages from granites and so on, in three different areas that could be the source of the, this dust. So Central Europe and the Alps, um, Britain over the British Irish ice sheet, and also Fenoscandia from the Scandinavian Fenoscandian ice sheet. These are the three main source areas. We can see that their zircon ages coming from these areas uh, are extremely different. So it's really an ideal position to test, to use zircon uranium lead dating in LERS because, because the potential source areas are so different in terms of their uranium lead ages. Central Europe is dominated by young zircon ages, whereas um, British Irish ice sheet and Fenoscandia are dominated by much older Precambrian, Precambrian ages. And Britain has a very dominant peak here in the late Precambrian, which is near absent from, from Fenoscandia. So we have really big differences in our source regions. And that's a critical, important way that we can then use the zircons to, to test the source. So here is our LERS. These are the uranium lead ages for the two phases of LERS accumulation, the first phase here, and then the second phase, the two yellow ones. And we can compare those to the tills, the Fenoscandian till, so the Danish till from the ice sheet over Scandinavia. And then the, this till comes from the British Irish ice sheet. And then we have sediment in the Dogger Lake, uh, so this is sediment in the North Sea and a sediment called the Thanet beds, which underlies the Pegwell Bay site. So this is a Paleocene sediment underlying the Lurs. And then Neogene sediments in the Southern North Sea, Southern Central North Sea to compare it to. And finally, the Rhine, the Rhine River, which is representative of the sediment load coming from the Rhine, coming from the Alps, coming from Central Europe. And the first thing that you can see is that in the Lurs, you have a clear dominance of these Precambrian age grains. And in the Rhine, they're not there, full stop. They're just not there, tiny, tiny amounts. So we can already pretty much straight away say that the Rhine is not a major way to get Lurse to this region. So we, this is not a main sediment source for this Lurse because the zircon ages don't allow it because they can, you have so many more of these older zircons in the Lurse. We can also say that the Lurse peaks tend to match more closely the sediment from the North Sea and the British Irish ice sheet, not so closely uh, the, um, the till from Fenoscandia, this till from Denmark, because here you can see the, <clears throat> the peaks are not quite the same point, they're not quite the same age in the Fenoscandian till. We see that there's these younger grains also in the Lurse. These could partly come from the Rhine sediment, but um, but they can also come from the Southern North Sea as well. So again, you don't need the Rhine. Um, are there any differences between the two samples? Maybe a little bit of a difference, but not massive differences. Again, you can just um, explain those differences maybe 
partly by variation in maybe the tills, variation in the sediments in the North Sea, because you can see already from these different parts of the North Sea, we have different sediment compositions. We should never just look at one provenance proxy. So I just want to finish up and say, okay, we also looked at heavy minerals, um, heavy mineral composition. Um, and uh, just to sum up briefly, this generally supports the zircon findings and gives us an extra dimension as well, because here are the two lurses, the lower accumulation pulse and the higher one. This is the underlying sediment, this Paleocene sediment that underlies the lurs, and this is the Rhine, and these are the tills and North Sea sediments. And this is the heavy mineral composition. And again, the Rhine doesn't look like it's a source because the Rhine has lots of olivine in it, which is absent from, from the lurs. So again, it precludes a major contribution from the Rhine. We can also exclude this sediment that lies underneath the lurs too, because if you look at this sediment is dominated by zircon, tourmaline and rutile, which are very, very uh, uh, resistant minerals to weathering. And so we have a very highly weathered uh, sediment here. And the lurs has much, much fewer of these and much more of these more unstable um, minerals, which weather more easily. So there must be other material, fresher material coming in. And again, the lurs looks much more like tills or sediment in the North Sea. And then finally, neodymium isotopes we can also look at too, because we can do that in more detail. Um, and neodymium isotopes can also be useful of the bulk sediments because uh, the different source areas also are slightly different. Scan Fennoscandian ice sheet up here has a very uh, highly um, negative uh, uh, neodymium isotope composition. Whereas the Ar British Irish ice sheet in North Sea is a bit less negative and continental Europe and the Rhine is much, much less negative. And you can see that the Lelurs shares a very strong neodymium isotopic composition, very similar to the North Sea and the British Irish ice sheet. So it supports the zircon ages. But you should also note that maybe, maybe you could argue there's maybe a little bit of Rhine input as well, or continental European input too, because these neodymium values are slightly lower than the average for the North Sea towards the Rhine, but it's difficult to be sure. And remember, this is from the bulk sediment. So this is also the fine grain dust, not just individual zircons, which are the coarser grain dust, because we can only analyze zircons more than 10, 15 microns in, in diameter when we look at uranium lead age. So it's, this is the coarse component versus the fine maybe. But note how there's no big difference in the neodymium isotopic composition for all of the LERS. So it looks like there's no change in isotopic composition and no change in source between across this, these two accumulation phases. So we then have a model for what happened. You have uh, around uh, uh, the time of the before the two ice sheets, the British Irish ice sheet and the Fennoscandian ice sheet here combined together, you have drainage of uh, material, drainage of meltwater into the north. So that's before 25,000 years ago. And when that happened, there's no lurse accumulation at Pegwell Bay. So you need the two ice sheets to come together because what happens then is the drainage is redirected to the south, past the site. And then all of that meltwater, all of that sediment rich meltwater comes past the site and then suddenly you have a source of dust to the site. Um, and this is then particularly enhanced when this lobe of ice here around 25 to 23,000 years ago, when this retreats suddenly and you get a big pulse, a catastrophic drainage of this ice sheet, which drains loads and loads of water, loads of sediment and gives you lots of source for the lurse and lots of dust in the atmosphere and the lurse accumulates in the first phase. The lobe then advances again, 22 to 21, and then you have a quiet period. And then a final collapse as the two ice sheets separate. And again, another meltwater pulse gives you more of the less, gives you more dust. So under this model, meltwater pulses driven by ice sheet collapses are driving changes in drainage, which changes, changes in dustiness, which drives changes in less accumulation. So there's no change in source, but what changes the two peaks what gives you the two pulses of dust is rather changes in productivity and availability of sediment in the same source region. All right, I'll skip that because we haven't got time. <laughs>
Um, what I will uh, <clears throat> just just what are the messages I suppose from these these examples that I've given you? The implications for uh, our understanding of uh, dust emission, transport, and deposition. Okay, because this is what I started the the seminar off by 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 saying we we can use these less deposits to understand these processes. Okay, so what are the messages we get from these studies? Uh, firstly, uh, that many of the things we thought we knew are, are wrong, or, or rather they're oversimplified at least. This is probably not a surprise. This is whenever you start to look more deeply at things, things get always get more complicated, of course. Um, but most of our accepted truths are wrong, basically. Dust accumulation rates are not tending to be these slow, continuous background dust accumulation. They vary really dramatically and very abruptly over a range of time scales. So uh, like these short term oscillations in Hungary to these big pulses of dust over a very short range of time in England. Processes in source regions are the critical factor that exert the major control on dust in the atmosphere. So sediment production is a critical factor changing how much dust comes into the atmosphere and how much dust is accumulated as less. Source regions are the critical thing. However, there's no simple explanation, single explanation here. So rivers, ice sheets, topography, they all interact in a very unique way for each place and give us a specific set of circumstances which drive up um, and interact with atmospheric processes which result in less deposition. Um, still, however, we, we do get some coincidence of less accumulation or dust accumulation over large areas. So, so some of these processes are clearly linked too. So while this atmospheric processes, wind transport is a critical factor, it's a prerequisite for LERS formation. Actually, what the implication is that it's actually of secondary importance in controlling dust variation. So variation in dust activity, atmospheric processes are less important than what happens in the source regions for controlling dust variability in the atmosphere. And that's something we really have to start incorporating into our models much more. The Aeolian step then is quite short. Other processes like rivers, ice sheets, sand dunes maybe, drive wider sediment dispersal in, in, the, uh, in the environment. Okay, thank you very much for your attention, for listening to these different examples. And uh, I also want to thank a lot of people who I have not got time to thank, but I want to mention just a couple. There's a loads of people involved in this research in different parts of the world. Um, and uh, some of them risk their lives doing it, like this <laughs> gavel here. Um, and um, <clears throat> I want to point out particularly Eunice, who's involved in this British stuff, and uh, Jun Shen and Lu Huayu up here, who are involved in the Chinese work, mm -hmm. as well as my other PhD students, Kiara and Katya Ramona, for their, uh, for, their, for their major contributions to this, to this work. Okay. And if you're interested in, uh, and looking at any of more of these uh, studies, you can um, you can read up on them in these journals uh, if you wish. And I'll, I'll leave this. And this has been recorded, so you can look at this anytime. So thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to take any questions. Of course. Okay. Thank you very much, Thomas. It was very enlightening, and gosh, I mean, there are beautiful sequences over there. <laughs> yeah. Next time, put me in your in your bag and I come. <laughs> <laughs> I'm helpful in the field. Uh, yes, no well, problem. We are... I'm always looking for field volunteers. Absolutely, no problem for that. So uh, I'm opening the podium for questions. We have already a question online and we have also uh, in the chat. So the, some of the students had to leave because they had another course. So some of ah, them sorry, they actually yes. requested me to ask you. So I will share your email with them if it's okay. Sure. So I will first go for the one written um, by Erden. Is there evidence for a possible impact on of human activities such as agriculture on the amount of dust in the atmosphere? Yeah. Yeah, it's a good question. <laughs> um, yes, I mean, definitely in, in recent times we see we see that effect in certain regions. I mean, you just have to think of the Dust Bowl in North America and the United States, for example. This is a great example of, of how human activity uh, actively changed the amount of dust in the atmosphere. 
because it it led to enhanced dust emission. Whether we can see that in the geologic record, that's uh, that's much trickier. Uh, what we do do see in some parts of, of the world is um, in uh, in in China, for example, we have a Holocene soil, which above that soil, then there's a Lurs layer, so a, a more wind deposition. But it's it's not the causal link is difficult to prove one way or another. Is it just is it a climate deterioration, or is it people actively using putting lurse onto the landscape for farming purposes or is it uh, that humans directly affect dust activity because of their practices locally um even you know even in the Hol in the holocene so i don't have an answer to that question in the geologic record i would suspect that locally at least there is an impact um, and we see that local effect certainly in in more recent times with with the dust bowl for example and uh, what i should also mention just china again that one of China's key missions has been to stabilize the dust regions because of the, uh, some of them at least, uh, and the dunes and, and dust sources, because it's such a, a significant environmental hazard and uh, that's been increasing in recent years. And that's a, partly a factor of overgrazing, for example, and land use. Yeah, I actually, yeah, I believe that there is an impact of agriculture. I just wonder mm. if we can see some impact following up on that question. If we can see some change in the loss or an atmospheric dust, okay, not only loss, mm. starting somewhere 10 to 8,000 years ago, you know, with the agricultural revolution. Maybe not on the globe, but I just yeah. wonder if we can see. I know, I know that we do see that in the Dead Sea. We, we have published a paper on that. And I just wonder globally. Let's go globally. I mean, if you see yeah. something 8,000 years ago. I, I absolutely I, I think that locally in, in specific areas I'm, I'm sure you're as you said for this example in the Dead Sea there there are going to be places where there's a definite impact of humans whether that translates into a larger scale increase in dustiness because of human activity within the hot parts of the Holocene I'm not sure uh, but but plausibly I would think at least in recent uh, uh, centuries, I would guess, and maybe even the recent time, especially in places like Central Asia and Eastern Asia, where you have farming practices resulting in this degradation of the of the landscape. And and these are such large areas that they plausibly could change the amount of dust over a hemispheric scale in the atmosphere. But I'm not aware of any evidence, or at least I'm not aware of anyone directly. Um, linking the two and saying one is the causal mechanism causality is such a tough thing to prove over such a wide area when it comes to humans versus climate in, impacting dust emissions um, causality is easier to prove on a local level <laughs> yeah. uh, well i will go to gabriel that he raised the hands and waiting peacefully gabriel go ahead yeah, thank you uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, I think I, I've learned more about those today. Uh, kind of a, <laughs> a lot to learn more. So uh, I'll just go straight to the point. Please uh, correct me if I'm wrong because you've used a couple of times interchangeably the, the dust, the term dust and sediment. I mean, because I've been looking at the idea mm. of, of course, the, the first thing I wrote for us is where do the dust come from? But of course, yeah. if you talk about the sediment, you think about the source, the origin, and the transportation in between, yeah. which is then the deposition. So is it a term based on the maybe grain size, micron, and yeah. stuff? Or what? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> it's good. I mean, it's good you, you raise that. I mean, it's something I should clarify. For sure. Uh, whereas you can define LERS as this grain size range that I talked about. So you have a dominant peak in this coarse silt. So it's silt dominated. So 40, 50, 60 micron peak, and then a range of anything from fine sand down to clay. When we talk about dust, this is a much more, it's not, it depends on who you talk to, how they define dust. If you talk to a climate modeler, often they define atmospheric dust as less than five microns or 10 microns. So you hear a lot about PM10 or PM2.5. These are atmospheric uh, 
um, abundances of particles that are less than 10 microns and less than 2.5 microns. And that's the atmospheric dust community today. When they talk about dust, that's what they mean. But there's a recent move in the community to actually extend that into the coarser fractions. So 20, 30, 40, even larger dust particles or, or sediment particles, because is evidence, increasing evidence that these two can be transported for long distances and they have considerable forcing effects in the climate. For example, Saharan sand grains or even coarse silt grains, 60 microns in diameter, are found all the way in the Bahamas, all the way across the Atlantic. Not many, but somehow they get there. And that sort of defies all the physics of transport of, of this stuff, right? So dust, I suppose you could say dust in the atmosphere, it's anything that can go under suspension transport. Right, so, so not saltation bouncing along the ground, so suspended in the atmosphere, so where you have these particles moving in the atmosphere freely without interacting with the ground. Um, and generally, we might define that as silts, so less than 65 microns or so downwards. So that's why I say it depends on who you talk to. If you talk to an atmospheric to scientist, them? they might say less than 10 microns. If you talk to a LERS person, it's less than 65 microns or so. Um, but actually, it's it's okay. dust is just a kind of bin term for a whole range of different yeah. particles with different different processes. Yeah. Okay, then I, I can add one more just because that mm. gets it clear now. And then, uh, how do you then uh, tie down like the source now? I mean, for the a typical example of the Hungarian site where you had the uh, sample collections and you had. Putin, you could easily link the part that oh, there is a river here, there is a, yeah. a big mountain that has been weathered down over time. And for, for instance, where you have a long distance transportation, and particularly for instance, I could use a, somewhere in my country, Nigeria, where you have a, a, a huge industrial estates. And of course, yeah. there's also influence of air. So, and some of this uh, sand has been, uh, dust particles has been transported across even the Atlantic depending yes. on the season. Mm. So is there a link back to the source and vis-a-vis -vis the, the deposition point? Uh, I mean, there, there is, it's just uh, the problem. Yeah, again, it's a size question to some extent. Size is so important because when we can use these single grain methods like zircon ages to trace the source, then we can sometimes be extremely, um, extremely specific about the possible source areas because they can be very uh, unique fingerprints, quite unique, uh, giving us uh, very diagnostic information. But the finer dust particles, then we have to we have a problem measuring those on an individual level, at least with the detail that we need, with the properties that we need. So it's much harder to constrain those less than 10 micron dust particles in terms of specific sources, because we need to look at the bulk chemistry often or the bulk some bulk uh, composition, general clay composition, for example. So it's con it leads to more controversy and more ambiguity in, in trying to trace these finer particles to their source regions. But it's perfectly, um, so there can be a diagnostic mineral, for example, that, that tells us something has come from the Sahara or a part of the Sahara. There can be another, di there can be a, a diagnostic age peak with zircons, which can tell us it has to come from this, but this particular terrain or this particular sediment. Uh, it's it's very it's difficult to generalize because it's so different for different uh, areas. But in general, it's harder with the finer material because of the the lack of ability to look at individual grains in detail. So the far travel material it's harder to source. There's a lot of questions about where Greenland dust comes from, for example, the dust mm -hmm. in Greenland, and. Yeah. Uh, we work we're doing uh, using hafnium isotopes uh, as well as the more traditional methods like neodymium strontium clay mineralogy using multiple methods it, it basically shows that none of the methods agree <laughs> actually um so we could uh, the traditional model is that all of this comes from taklamakan and, and east asia okay so northern china and northwestern china but it's not the unique solution. When you look at all of these different data, types of data, some, some of those data sets exclude the Taklamakan as a source. Other ones suggest Northern Europe as a source, Northwestern Europe. Other ones suggest the Sahara for a source. So it is really, what we're looking at is yeah. probably a mixture of many different sources 
which makes it extremely complicated to unpick those those details and place specific source regions. Uh, and to to even add, I mean, just to say, in addition to the complexity you are talking about, most of the sediment or the dust after being broken down to a finer particle, when they are yeah. lifted up, sometimes they interact with other particles, yes. and interactions continues until they get deposited. And yeah, uh, clay There's mineralogy a, a, has a lot to do with that. I <laughs> know it's a yeah. complex subject. I mean, there's, it's very complex and there's many, in the source regions, you produce huge range of grain sizes. You don't just produce fine silts or clays. You can produce sands and gravels and so on. And all of that gets transported in some way. So, and, and some of the sand gets transported with the fine material, as we know now from these modern studies that look and find these sand grains coming from the Sahara all the way across the Atlantic and so on. So it's really um, um, uh, Thank complex. you very much. Thank you no problem. Much. Thank you for the question. I think that if there is not a question, because we are late, very late and deep into, <laughs> so very quickly, somebody, uh, Mo, Mo, go ahead, Mo. Yeah, can I, Nico? Ah, it's you, okay. Yeah, good, good. Yeah, just uh, before I ask my question, the professor already mentioned the region Teklamakan and northwestern part of China. Yeah. Actually, I was born there and I spent most of my life there. And uh, I just would like to say, like you also mentioned about the uh, loose disasters in the Beijing area. Yeah. But uh, in my hometown, just next to the Teklamakan desert, we are, since decades, we are experiencing very severe like mm. you can even we can even call it disaster. It's uh, it will make your whole road, whole town mm. invisible. It's very uh, like mm. a, now, literally we we used to accept the term of like uh, we normally we say raining, snowing. Now in the meteorological centers, they call the loose raining of loose loose. This mm. term became officially mm. accepted. Less rain. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yes, mm. so I think it's uh, deserve it to pay more research yeah. on this thing. Uh, and yeah. there are many people, uh, local people, we assume to connect it with, they say, okay, we are living next to the desert, so we, mm. we should, I don't think that is the case because my parents told me they don't experience this kind of uh, mm. thing okay. in the past. So yeah. that's interesting. Think, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, thanks very much for your point. Yeah, it's, uh, this is a really interesting region. We did a provenance study on the Taklamakan Desert, by the way, uh, on the sediment where it comes from, but we focused mainly on the alluvial and the sand the sediments and the dunes. So more should be done on, on this dust around the area. That so would be really interesting. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, thank you. So I guess the last question is uh, Mo. Or not? He has a hand up, yes. Well, maybe he left. Mo, one, two, three. <sighs> well. I can, sorry, I can have a good, quick question if I can. Okay, go ahead, please. Uh, thanks. Uh, hi, Thomas. So uh, the I'm name up. of the place is uh, uh, Dunasek too. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Thank you, uh, thank you. And uh, I, I quickly went over that paper and saw that uh, you concluded that the main, um, I mean, a factor that influences the dust transport is the uh, changes or, or phases, different phases of the Arctic oscillation. Yeah. And my question is that, do you also do research on, because now we know that human activity influences this Arctic oscillation. Do you know, do you have some ideas how it will influence or how it is already influencing this dust transport? In Hungary, in Europe, or in general? In general. Yeah. I mean, in, in the current, in current climate state, you mean in a sort of recent climate, recent decades? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know it's a different time period. Yeah, <laughs> um, I, this is uh, not uh, my strong point, <laughs> to be quite honest. Um, I'm, I'm more uh, in, involved in these earlier records, but, but uh, and I think with, with Hungary, I mean, the, that's, and in Central Europe, there's much less dust, of course, now than there was during the time period we, we talked about with that site. We'd done a such cool, <laughs> sorry, I can't say, uh, with the DSZ site. Um, so we have 
incredibly high rates of dust sediment deposition during the last glacial maximum at that site, and much, much less now because of the much less active sources. But still, this is not impossible to get these dust storms in Europe um, or dust events in Europe, I should say now. But whether they're changing over recent decades uh, with, with, um, with changes in Arctic Oscillation or with, with, with human activity, I, I'm sorry, I can't, I can't answer that question. I'm not sure. Um, but there's a whole, there's a lot of there's a community working on this, but I don't know, I don't know that off the top of my head the answer. Sorry about that. Okay, okay. No worries. Thanks. That's a good question there. Okay. So I think what we need to cut because we are very, like very deep into the second half time. So yeah, Thomas, I'm really sorry again, about that. thank you very much. And um, do you will to be listed in our mails for future events, uh, future seminars that we have? Absolutely, yeah, please do. It'd be nice okay. to, to turn up when I can. It's very interesting. Great, fantastic. Is including. Okay, mm -hmm. so thank you again. And I will share the email with those students that they asked me. Thank you very much. Thanks for inviting me. And I'm, I apologize for overrunning so much. I, uh, yeah. No, it was great. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thanks.